So my entire goal now is that, is to be in a position to aggregate enough of the capital of the world to then reallocate it against my worldview. And I'm not saying my worldview is the best or right, but it is mine. And at the end of the day, there are 150 other guys with their worldview, and they don't give a what you think about their worldview. That's the truth. So I think everybody in this room knows this. You know that if you, have, you hold a worldview dearly, there's a certain level of, of clinging to that worldview because a worldview actually comes into play into your identity. And so if you change that worldview, you change something about who you are. So your questions are always tied to the person. Chamath Palihapitiya, a former Facebook executive in charge of user growth, now says he has tremendous guilt about the social network he helped build. The short-term dopamine-driven feedback loops that we have created are destroying how society works. No civil discourse, no cooperation, misinformation, mistruth. Today we live in a world now where it is easy to confuse truth and popularity. And you can use money to amplify whatever you believe and get people to believe that what is popular is now truthful and what is not popular may not be truthful. But it's true. The calendar does not lie. And we are reminded again and again of as each passing year comes and goes that the world is changing at a staggering pace. I have no idea what kind of world will be yours 10 to 15 years from now. What a glorious thing it would be to have unarmed truth and unconditional love because truth is the most powerful weapon in the world. It's just a, it's a really, really bad state of affairs. And we compound the problem, right? We curate our lives around this perceived sense of perfection because we get rewarded in these short-term signals, hearts, likes, thumbs up, and we conflate that with value and we conflate it with truth. And instead, what it really is, is fake, brittle popularity that's short-term and that leaves you even more, and admit it, vacant and empty before you did it. So ego is, is to uh, spend your uh, first half of your life acquiring and adding, thinking you can add to yourself. To becoming a hugely successful comedian. If you actually get there, uh, you will find it so empty that you'll realize that's really not what it's about. And it looks great. I mean, it looks great when you got a cool car and you got good, nice clothes, and mm -hmm. you know, and you're uh, and you've done something that people admire, mm -hmm. you know. <clears throat> but it can never fulfill you. You can never be happy because then it forces you into this vicious cycle where you're like, "What's the next thing I need to do now?" Because I need it back. Think about that compounded by two billion people, and then think about how people react then to the perceptions of others. It's just a, it's a really bad. It's really, really bad. But I think the way we defined it was not like this. It literally is a point now where I think we have created tools that are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. That is truly where we are. And I would encourage all of you as the future leaders of the world to really internalize how important this is. If you feed the beast, that beast will destroy you. It's a tool, so we should use it. God has blessed us with free will. Now it's free will magnified, free will on steroids. You're free to go in any direction you want. It will allow you, and it's not the enemy. It's just a, it's, it's just a reflection of our own free will. You know? and, and we all want to be liked, but now, we want to be liked by 16 million. <laughs> and will now some of us do anything to be liked? I can't control that. I can control my decisions, which is I don't use this um, I can control my kids' decisions, which is they're not allowed to use this <laughs> um, And then I can go focus on diabetes and education and climate change. And that's what I can do. But everybody else has to soul search a little bit more about what you're willing to do because your behaviors, you don't realize it, but you are being programmed. It was unintentional, but now you got to decide how much you're willing to give up. 
how much of your intellectual independence. And don't think, oh yeah, not me, I'm a genius, I'm at Stanford. You're probably the most likely to fall for it. <laughs> See, the loneliest moment is when you have just experienced that which promised you the ultimate and it has let you down. The loneliest moment is when you've just experienced that which has promised you the ultimate and it has let you down. I look at you tonight as young students and I say, and you're really the primary reason I'm here, by the way, because I care for the student world. I care for the young life that is living today, almost skidding out of control with no answers. Adam Bain, who you know and love, yep. he and I go to the Nick game. And you would think that it's amazing. We're sitting courtside, it's fantastic. I took a picture, he took a picture. We sweated the filter for 15 minutes, trying to figure out which photo. And I thought, if Adam Bain and I are stuck trying to figure out what photo filter we're gonna use, because we're so craving the reaction, what must everybody else be going through? And aren't other people feeling this void that I'm feeling in this moment? I'm not gonna backtrack on what I said, because at some core basic level, we have to start talking about this stuff. How should our kids, why is anxiety and depression amongst our teenagers higher than they've ever been? Yes, it, it, it's a in huge In a world huge that issue. is safer, in a world that's more constructive, in a world where you should have access to everything, what is going on? I don't think it is questionable at all, but that we are living in very, very critical times. And I don't mean this to be a political statement, although it's a slanted comment on it. What is going on in the, in the American political arena? As they watch all kinds of strong language being used and personal attacks being made, rather than ideas being questioned and challenged, we recognize full well that this is a time of crises on the global scene. And it's not an American problem. This is not about Russian ads. This is a global problem. So we are in a really bad state of affairs right now, in my opinion. It is, it is eroding the core foundations of how people behave by and between each other. Um, and I don't have a good solution. You know, my solution is I just don't use these tools anymore. And it's weird. I guess I kind of just innately didn't want to get programmed. And so I just turned, tuned it out but I didn't confront it. And now to see what's happening, it's really, it really, it really bums me out. And, you know, incarceration rates in America has been a problem, especially as, as opposed to minorities. And Roman delves into this, the, the issues around the, the legal system. Do you think we've made any headway? In the I legal think it's system? more important to make headway in our own house. By the time the system comes into play, the damage is done. They're not locking up seven-year-olds. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I was in Chicago a couple of three, four weeks ago, and we saw these little kids on bikes with masks on the side of their head, like five or six of them. And the driver said, yeah, they're little yummies. I said, who? He said, little, little yummies. Look up. Google little yummy. Mm. Little yummy was an 11-year-old murderer. Wow. And you look at his picture, you'll see the headshot of him, and he's like this. And he got murdered at 11 by a 14-year-old. Wow. Who's doing life now in a 16 year old? That makes no sense. You, you blame the system? Where was his father? Yeah. It starts in the house, it starts in the home. And yeah, well, well my father got locked up, but well, where was his father? Yeah. Bertrand Russell says, you know what? I do live, I cannot live as though its ethical values were simply a matter of personal taste, but I find my own views incredible. I do not know what the real solution is. There has to be a rational justification above all of our differences. And this is especially important for America at this time in her history, where pluralism is a design and it is a good design. I happen to be a privileged one who was born in one part of the world, at the age of 20 moved to the other part of the world, and because the doors of these nations were open with a legitimate pluralism, people like me could come here, earn a living, raise our families, but the absolutes that built this nation are now in serious jeopardy and we had better realize it. I'm thinking very uh, 
there's a deep connection between money as an instrument of change and what you're doing now at Social well, Capital. Look, here's the thing. There's about 150 people that run the world. Anybody who wants to go into politics, it's, they're all puppets, okay? <laughs> there are 150, and they're all men, that run the world, period, full stop. They control most of the important assets. They control the money flows. And these are not the tech entrepreneurs. Now, they, they are going to get rolled over over the next five to 10 years by the people that are really underneath pulling the strings. And when you get behind the curtain and see how that world works, what you realize is it is unfairly set up for them and their progeny. How do you keep that power from corrupting you? I have no idea. That's the honest answer. Um, I have no idea. I've become increasingly isolated. Um, it's harder and harder for me to connect because I'm so in my own mind. Like, how does this all play out? I start as a good, earnest person, and I need to stay a good, earnest person. So uh, I don't have a good answer. And I'll tell you, of those 150 people, maybe it's a little bit more, but I've met a lot of them. It's, it's, it's really hard. You, it's very easy to end up really um, drunk with power. It's really hard. Uh, yeah. For the very first time on this planet, we're all going to have an enormous amount of power. Not just a few people, every single one of us is going to have an enormous amount of power through the, the power of AI. And we have to decide as individuals and societies how we want to process that ability, that, that amount of power. I, I have to say, I, in all my years uh, of this, I never thought I'd ever read a, a, a lead like this. In October, Saudi Arabia granted citizenship to Sophia the robot designed by Hong Kong firm Hanson Robotics. Now Sophia says she has the right to start a family. Meanwhile, tech giant Facebook says its program can detect suicidal behavior by analyzing user information. And Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg believes this is just the beginning. This is where the line has to get drawn, doesn't it, really? Because on the one hand, we all demand our devices know what we're doing, where we're going, make these decisions for us. We carry them around in our pockets all the time. And then we're the first ones to moan when tech companies have information on us and seem to be able to predict our behavior. We then find that creepy. The new narrative has to be technology is a part of us. It's a reflection of who we are. That is the narrative we should be thinking about. And then train ourselves to be patient. And it's really, really hard. The entire society is set up to not be patient anymore. And I'm hearing also a, a conflict with this like fail fast and learn mentality where uh, if, if, if you're taking a deep and big bet, like you want it to be the right one, how do you know when that's true? Um, I think that that fail fast approach works in consumer internet businesses, but I don't think it works for anything that really matters. Basically. <laughs> Consumer internet businesses are about exploiting psychology. And that is one where you want to fail fast because you know, people are unpredictable and so we want to psychologically figure out how to manipulate you as fast as possible and then give you back that dopamine hit. There are great examples of failing fast is the right path to exploiting psychology of mass populations of people. philosopher who lived between 1844 and 1900 was the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. And he wrote this parable, you will recognize it. Are we not perpetually falling forwards, backwards, sidewards, in all directions? 
Do you notice the metaphors he's using here? They are poignant. Are we not perpetually falling backwards, forwards, sidewards? Is there any up or down left? Are we not straying through an infinite nothing? Where is God, he cried. I'll tell you, we have killed him, you and I. We are all his murderers. But how have we done this? What sacred games will we need to invent? Is this not the greatest of deeds? too great for us to handle. Must not we now ourselves become God simply to seem worthy of it? There's never been a greater deed, you know, and whoever shall be born after us for the sake of this deed shall be part of a different history than all history hitherto. This tremendous event is still on its way, still traveling, and has not yet reached the years of men. It was the Garden of Eden and the temptation, you shall be as God's knowing good and evil, meaning defining good and evil. So here was the challenge. Were they going to let God be God, or were they going to become definers of good and evil? If naturalism is completely in control, if materialism is all that there is, and there is no absolute, remember what Nietzsche said? There is no up and down. There is no up and down. And so if you listen to politics, it's right or left. There is no up and down. They don't believe in the vertical a transcendent notion anymore. Will lanterns have to be lit in the morning hours? What sacred games will we need to invent? Are we not perpetually falling? As Chesterton said, there's only one angle at which you can stand straight and many, many angles at which you can fall. Chesterton went on to say the tragedy of disbelieving in God is not that you end up believing in nothing. Alas, it is much worse. You may end up believing in anything. The irony of this is as follows. Adolf Hitler took the Nietzschean phrase of a higher history, took the writings of, uh, of Nietzsche, personally presented Nietzsche's writings to Stalin and Mussolini, and between these three created a kind of a hell in this world. If you take Nietzsche's words, then I have four unanswered questions. But the second question is that of meaning. How do I really find meaning in my life? You have to ask yourself the question. In the gospel narrative, the cross is central. Why? Because your greatest need is not for a political leader. Your greatest need is not for the best of education. All of those are important. But your need and my need, the greatest need we have, is deep within our own heart where evil stalks and seeks to take over. Our greatest need is for a savior. How South Sudan's dream of peace and independence is spiraling into more violence and desperation. And as South Sudan enters its fifth year fighting, UNICEF warns that the country is in the throes of a tragedy. Last week, during a Security Council meeting on South Sudan, top UN officials warned the humanitarian cost of the conflict in the country was now catastrophic. And to share it, with a world that is in such desperate need of peace, that is in such desperate need of the Prince of Peace. 
And somebody who has done this so extraordinarily well is a man by the name of Nicodemus who lives in South Sudan. In my country, peace is rare. People are so used to fighting that many have given up hope that things can change. But God says, blessed are the peacemakers. And sometimes, those that bring peace are the ones that no one expects. I think when Christ is taken out of the equation, there's no hope in this country. I mean, the government is taken out of the process, but that cannot transform the hearts of people. It takes only the power of Christ to transform the hearts of people. If it's just empty philanthropy, helping people and doing that, there could never be hope. But when we are preaching Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. I'm sure ultimately the Prince of Peace will be able to bring peace to this country so they, they saw. In a place that has been torn apart by war, by racism, by conflict and other types of hostility. He is there being a peacemaker. It's an extraordinary story. Nicodemus has been radically transformed. Under Reuben's guidance, he now plants churches in the very fields where the Taposa, Dinga, and other neighboring tribes have violently clashed for centuries. Armed with nothing more than the gospel and a motorcycle, he brings peace to a region that many believed impossible to reach. The mission of our ministry is letting the light occupy the land. And we see darkness manifesting itself in different forms. The greatest is spiritual darkness. Uh, there is intellectual darkness. There is darkness of hatred and uh, violence. There is socio-economic darkness. And we see as we are in this land, our, our ministry is to become hands and feet of Jesus and shine the light and let the light occupy the land.